we, you know, normally we don't have other people on. I, I invited them because uh, um, we were kind of discussing some of these uh, discussions and stuff on the side and they had, it was really helpful and I invited them. They actually joined. I don't know if you guys will get anything out of this because we've already talked about a lot of this, but uh, welcome anyway. Um, do you guys just want to describe, uh, just briefly introduce yourself and, um, and what you do? And, and Roseanne might be, I don't think any, most of the people here know about MLC. So it might be, if you want to just describe that briefly, because that kind of led to this uh, collaboration and discussion, that would be cool. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Roseanne. So Jason and I here uh, run ML Collective. It is a nonprofit that basically got people together to work on research without having to employ everyone. Um, whoever wants to get into research, we don't need to interview them. And yeah, they just show their interest and then they can come and freely collaborate with us. Uh, Mitchell here also, I think, uh, get to us as part of MLC or uh, work with us through MLC. But uh, what else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Jason, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Roseanne, Roseanne covered it. Um, work on ML research. We don't have we don't have much money, but we have interested people. Uh, Roseanne runs a reading group every Friday, which anyone's welcome to join. Um, and we worked a bit with Subutai on some ideas over the last six months. Also, we were kind of inspired by how Nementa does research, kind of like doing research out in the open. Um, I think it's informed some of our some of our decisions over the last half year or so. And I should say Roseanne and um, Jason were both at Uber Research and had invited me to give a talk a couple of years ago, uh, back when we were doing in-person talks, which was, uh, which was great, which is a it was great to meet them in, in person way back then. I miss those days. Miss those days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mitchell, do you want to introduce yourself real briefly? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Mitchell, um, and I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Washington. I was um, going to do an internship with Roseanne, and it, uh, it turned into me joining the awesome ML Collective uh, team. And so um, since then, I've, I've gotten to do some research with um, them, and it, it's been a really fun opportunity to also, you know, work with people such as yourself. Hey, and uh, just to introduce you to our team, um, this is pretty much our uh, set of researchers. Jeff Hawkins is our founder, um, and uh, well, so you might, I don't know if you'd know anyone else on this uh, but uh, basically, they're all, we have a pretty big mixture of sort of neuroscience background, machine learning, computer science, so on. So welcome. It's great to have you guys here. Um, OK, so let me get started. OK, um, so the we're going to talk about small world structures. Um, I'm really unsure what people here will think about this, whether it's relevant. but. Uh, Jason, Roseanne, and Mitchell and I had a long discussion uh, over, you know, we meet every few weeks, uh, talk about sparsity and sparse structures and stuff. And um, this kind of led to uh, investigation of small world. And for me, this became a little bit of a rabbit hole. I started reading a couple of these papers. Um, I found it really interesting, but, and there is a connection to the stuff we do, but it's unclear, you know, whether people will really be interested or not. But uh, I thought I'd uh, go over this stuff. Um, so the main paper, oh, so here's the outline of the, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, just a brief description of small world networks, what they are, uh, this discussion of small world structure in brains and other places that shows up everywhere, it looks like. Um, and in particular, I uh, wanna talk a little bit about small world structure in learning and neural networks. Um, and then just a general discussion on sparsity, cortical columns and stuff. And I'll, I'll stick, cause I wasn't really sure what the level of interest would be in this group. I, um, I stuck to pretty high level concepts here, but at the end, um, if people want to uh, talk in more detail, particularly on point three, there's a the paper that I'll go through. There's a bunch of interesting kind of things in there that uh, you know people might be interested in, but uh, you know, we could leave that to the end to go into the details and anyone who doesn't want to can, uh, you know, can drop off a point. Um, so one, things like network theory, why do we even care about this stuff? Um, well, clearly neurons in the brain are connected in a very complex network. 
And there are a bunch of uh, sort of abstract questions that may be practical that, that sort of come up. Um, so things like, are there simple characterizations of these networks? Uh, can we understand how good these connectivity patterns are? There's a variety of different types of ways it can be connected. Um, you know, at Numenta, we want to create really, really sparse networks um, and run them on efficiently on hardware. So are there some types of sparse connections that are better than others, particularly when you get to the limits? Uh, and then how does this impact learning or inference? So these are some of these sort of questions that in part are addressed by looking at these small world structures. Okay. So let me drive into the, the, the main paper uh, I'll go over is, uh, well, one of the two main papers, uh, Watts and Strogatz. Uh, this came out in 1998. It's only two and a half pages. Um, it is really concise, very clearly written. I really enjoyed reading this paper. And um, uh, the, I think I emailed it out to this uh, to, to the group so you guys can take a look at it. Um, but I, it's very, very well written, I thought. Um, so what there, and, and I should say, this is the main, this is the paper that kind of start, started all of the analysis on small world networks. I think they had something like 45,000 citations or something ridiculous like that. Um, it, it's pretty crazy, um, but it's, it's cited all over the place. So um, they, they started their uh, analysis by looking at two different extremes of different, two different types of networks. So on the left is a, a regular graph, in particular, a ring lattice. So here you have nodes. Uh, in this particular example, you have nodes that connect to three different neighbors, uh, to all their three nearest neighbors. So like this, uh, let me look up the... So this node, for example, connects here, here, and here. Um, and it also connects to the three uh, on the other side as well. Okay, so it's a very regular structure. And then the right-hand side, it's a completely random uh, graph where the probability of connecting to any other node is, is uh, roughly equal, okay? And so you can see these as, as they, they looked at these as uh, two extremes in a spectrum. And they created a, an algorithm for sort of smoothly interpolating between uh, these two types of networks. And the algorithm is, the entire algorithm is can be stated in just one sentence. Uh, just one thing I really like about this paper is that they just, they just say things very concisely. So this is a quote from the paper. So you basically start from a ring lattice, with this, which is that regular graph on the left with n vertices and k edges per vertex. And then we rewire each edge at random with probability p. Okay, so that's it. So you start with the ring lattice and just randomly rewire some fraction of it. Um, and so this is- the number uh, of edges always the same, Subita? Uh, yeah, I think in their algorithm to keep the number of edges fixed, uh, but from what I understand later on, particularly in the physics world, they've, they've changed that. So they sometimes will add edges. Uh, so they, uh, they, they might keep a regular network underneath it, but then add a bunch of random edges on top. So that's another way that people have done it. But I think uh -huh. in their original one, they kept the number of edges fixed. Also, I mean, there's, there's an assumption here. I mean, this, this ring lattice is this, it's like okay. There's there's a lot of assumptions in that. You know, what what nearest neighbors would be would depend on how many dimensions. You know, if I have a two, you know, oh, this is like a one dimensional torus here. You know, so yeah. I mean, yeah. Is, is this analysis everything we're hearing is independent of that? You know. Yeah, they they you can everything I'm I'm saying here generalizes to multiple dimensions as well, as far as I understand. Again, I'm not an expert. You know. Mitchell, yeah. Jason, Roseanne, you guys might know uh, better. Um, but my understanding is it all generalizes to multiple dimensions. I mean, we work so much here in so many high dimensions. And then, and then when we think about high dimensional spaces, some of the intuitions you get from simple, smaller dimensional spaces don't apply. So I'm immediately thinking like, oh yeah, what's the nearest neighbor? Um, you know, if you have like a very 10,000 dimensional vector, nearest neighbor is yeah. for me, something very different. So yeah. Okay, well, I'll just put it aside for now, but that's the first thing that jumped in my head. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, the, this is a diagram from their paper. Um, it shows kind of the spectrum. On the left-hand side, P is zero, which means you don't rewire anything. So you got the um, regular network. Uh, on the, the other extreme where you, you know, rewire everything, you get the random network. And then somewhere in between is this sort of small world uh, structure. Um, they looked at, they 
two different metrics uh, to help kind of characterize these uh, networks. So the first one is the path length, which is the average shortest distance between vertices. So if you look at uh, any two vertices, what is the number of hops you need to get from one point to the other? And so uh, random graphs um, have very sh generally have very short path lengths. It's, uh, you can find uh, between any two vertices, usually a pretty small number of hops will get you from one to the other. Uh, the regular graphs um, do not. Uh, as you, you know, if you want to get from one to the other, you'd have to sort of hop multiple times around this lattice until you get to the other side. Um, and of course, um, they didn't really talk about this, but complete graphs where everything is connected to everything um, has, you know, always a path length of one. So that's always the sh shortest, really uh, shortest path length. Um, the other, uh, so this is relatively easy. The other one is uh, something called the clustering coefficient. Um, and what this says is basically, if a vertex A is connected to two other vertices B and C, how likely is it that B and C are connected to each other? Okay, so how clicky is this graph? Um, and uh, it turns out that regular graphs like the lattice, uh, when I showed you are pretty highly clustered. Random graphs are not well clustered. They have a very low clustering coefficient. And again, complete graphs are the most clustered. You know, the probability of this is always going to be one. So you can kind of see these, both of these here. If you look at this kind of blue vertex, um, you know, you can get, uh, hold on. Move my... Boy, it's really hard to navigate zoom here. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you start at the blue um, uh, circle here, if you want to get to the other edge of the graph, you know, you can hop three at a time. Um, but so, you know, so that's, that's, you know, how many, uh, that's going to be the average path length is going to be basically uh, the number of nearest, you look at the number of total nodes divide by the number of uh, nearest neighbors divide by two. That's roughly how many hops uh, you'll need on average. Um, and then if you, you can kind of understand the clustering here, this guy is connected to this one here, and it's also connected to this one. These two are also likely to be connected. Um, so you can see that this, this graph is somewhat cliquish, and that's true for most of the guys nearby. Of course, if you pick someone that's three away here, it's not going to be connected to a node that's three away there. But most of the guys in its neighborhood, or most of the nodes in its neighborhood are going to be connected to each other. So these regular graphs are relatively highly clustered, uh, but random graphs are not. Um, so uh, let's see. Hey, Subutai, uh, oh, on, the, yeah. on the path length, um, would a completely random graph have the sort of shortest expected path length for any graph of like n, n nodes? Um, well, a, a, a complete graph would have the shortest, but if you were to, uh, yeah. constrain the number of edges, um, I think a random graph, uh, you know, for a fixed uh, number, well, at least in this, in this, in this set of extremes, if you start with these kind of graphs and, and randomly rewire everything, that's going to have the shortest path length. In general, um, I don't know what we can say, you know, I think there's going to be a spectrum between random and complete graphs. Uh, there might be some others that have, uh, shorter path lengths uh, than completely random graphs. I mean, in, in a random graph, you might have isolated nodes too, right? You could, you could have nodes that aren't connected to anything. Yeah, so, yeah, it yeah, depends on how you, yeah, it depends on how you define the rewiring. You can actually get some nodes that are completely on their own hmm. without, without any connections. So um, for a given number of nodes and, a, and a, a, an edge budget, completely random graph might not be the best you could do. I wonder, is there a constructive solution like given N and P or whatever? Um, you could have an algorithm that spits out the correct connectivity. Yeah, there, there might be. Um, I, I'm sure there is. Uh, I'm just not an expert. Yeah. Okay. And but, then, but random graphs are pretty good, basically. Um, if you have a fixed edge budget, random graphs are quite good. Um, and okay. It, 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 I, I'm, my guess would be they're not optimal. Okay. And on the clustering coefficient side, um, could you create an even more cluster graph by rather than having a complete ring, just sample like a neighborhood and then connect absolutely everything in that neighborhood and then maybe have one edge going out of the neighborhood? 
could you construct then small world networks starting with that? Um, but that's sort of how you construct small world networks. I mean, you could get higher clustering. You know, you could have neighbors that are fully connected and then no connections to anyone else. Uh, that would be the highest possible clustering, I think. Um, right. Like, I think this clustering coefficient would be 0. 0.5, right? Or maybe um, 0.5 max. Yeah, I, I haven't calculated. That sounds reasonable. I think they say in their paper that um, the ring lattices, they converge to a clustering coefficient about three quarters, if I remember correct, yeah. correctly. That's uh, whereas uh, complete graphs would be one. So. Okay, yeah. And anyone, please correct me if I'm uh, misstating something here. So one, um, one thing I think is that uh, yeah. the, the ring lattice, uh, should converge to um, to a clustering coefficient one because um, as you start to go from connecting just to my nearest neighbors, then to my two nearest neighbors, then to your three nearest neighbors, um, as you increase this, doesn't the clustering coefficient just rise and rise and rise until the end of the day you're connected to uh, everyone? In, in which case, it's one. Yeah, um, yeah. But so you know, I think that, you're right. As you, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. That asymptotics that you're talking about might be actually okay. Let's actually increase the number of, um, like let's scale the number of nodes because then I think that, you know then then if you're scaling the number of nodes as well, then you you'd never get to one. That's right. Yeah. If you if you if you keep increasing k, which is the number of nearest neighbors, you're going to get to one. And I think if you keep k constant as you increase the number of nodes, I think that's what uh, I think that's when it converges to three fourths. Um, okay, so what are small world networks? Uh, we haven't really defined them yet. Um, so a regular graph has well-defined connectivity and high clustering. Uh, random graphs have small average path length. And so small world networks are somewhere in between in kind of an interesting way. Um, uh, and this graph kind of uh, shows it. So what this graph shows is um, uh, they plot path length as a function of p, which is these solid dots, and the clustering coefficient as a function of, of p as these uh, open uh, squares. So on the top right, uh, sorry, top left here, you have essentially zero probability of rewiring. Um, and so that's going to be a completely regular graph. So this has a high clustering coefficient and high path length. Um, these are actually normalized, uh, but uh, we can just ignore this for now. They have high clustering coefficient and high path length. And as you start increasing the probability of rewiring, um, you know, the path length is going to drop. Uh, and on the bottom right, you have a completely random graph. Now, what's interesting is that this is a log scale. And so what happens is, as you start having a very tiny increase in this probability of rewiring, you can see that the path length drops dramatically and gets very close to the random graph. But the clustering coefficient actually stays high for quite a while and before it starts dropping. So there's this whole kind of region in between where you have high clustering coefficients and pretty low path lengths. And that's kind of the magic of small world graphs is this region here. Um, and so in some sense, these small world networks are very efficient. They have very short path lengths and a high clustering coefficient. Um, whereas a complete graph would have both, but they're extremely inefficient because you have all of n squared edges in a, in a complete graph. So it allows you to get the efficiency of this um, uh, you know, very, very well. So here's some examples of uh, real networks. Uh, anyone want to guess what this is? Anyone at Nementa? <laughs> this is a trick question. I can't see any of the text on it, so. Well, yeah, that's on purpose. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> visual cortex, so, right? My, my thing. Yeah. So when I first saw this, I was like, "Oh, this is a cortical yeah. network," but it's not. It's the power grid in New York State, um, and I think you look at transformers and junctions and stuff. This is the what it looks like, but it sure looks like a cortical network to me. Um, uh, uh, here's. I'm sorry, Lucas. Uh, uh, my first guess was the second slide, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, I also thought this is oh, this is a cortical network. But so this is a 
uh, cortical network. Um, so this is from, uh, actually, this is from Jeff's book, Thousand Brains, but it's uh, originally from uh, Feldman and Van Essen. So they mapped all the connections between different uh, regions of the uh, uh, neocortex, particularly in the macaque monkey. Um, and they had this you know, network, and this is a small wall structure. And you can see that there's a lot of sort of local connectivity, but then there are these sort of long range connections that show up uh, every once in a while. Um, and so, uh, oh, and uh, so social networks are also small world. So this is a, a screenshot I took from a YouTube video that explains it. So there's about a billion Facebook users in the world, um, 70 billion links. Um, but the average shortest path between any two people in the world is four. So we often hear about this thing of, oh, there are six degrees of separation between any two people in the US, but it's actually smaller than that. It's four and it's anywhere in the world. Um, so that, that's kind of remarkable. Um, um, so what, why are these properties useful? So this is what I was uh, trying to think through a little bit. Um, so you, you can understand why short paths are useful. Right, they can transmit information very efficiently. But why is clustering uh, useful? So in physical networks, um, such as the brain and the power grid and so on, clustering will optimize kind of the physical, the total physical path length. Um, if you, um, you know, if in a small world network, most of the connections are gonna be local and so they'll be small uh, and nearby. And you'll have, you only need a few long range connections to efficiently transmit information everywhere. The probability of these long range connections can be really, really small. Um, and so this is a very efficient way if you wanna minimize the total length of your wires or in brains, if you wanna minimize the total length of axons, this could be a really good way to do that. Uh, so physically, uh, you can see why, these, uh, why this property might be, might be helpful. Um, but that wasn't really satisfying to me. It's like, if I'm building algorithms or networks, I don't really care about physical length. Um, so is, th is this also useful in non-physical networks? Um, and it turns out the answer is yes. So John Kleinberg answered this in a nature paper in 2000. His paper was only one page long. <laughs> That's uh, very concise. Um, I think it's well-written, not quite as well-written as the Watson Strogatz paper. Um, it's called Navigation in a Small World. And he basically claimed that it's easy, the reason it's helpful in non-physical networks is it's an algorithmic reason. It's easier to find short chains between points in, some, in small world networks. And so in general, we know short, shortest path algorithms are really hard, uh, but with small world networks, and it turns out only with small world networks, you can, you can algorithmically find local algorithms for discovering these short paths. So if you're like a, a person and you have social connections um, and you, you only know about your, the people you're immediately connected to, you can actually find efficient algorithms for getting to anyone else in the world. Uh, you, know, you might not find it in four hops, but you can find very efficient uh, algorithms. What's surprising about this to me is that you say it's a local algorithm. It's so, a local, exactly. That seems um, hard to imagine at first. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I haven't dived into all of the uh, uh, you know, various types of algorithms uh, you have, but what he found in his paper is that uh, at very specific clustering coefficients, um, uh, you, you, know, you, get, you can find these uh, efficient algorithms and, and find these really short paths. And you can see that as you divert away from that, uh, you know, the chance of finding short paths uh, increases. Uh, he didn't use, I think his definition of clustering was a little bit different, but I think the basic intuition uh, still applies. Um, so this kind of explains a lot of things like, uh, for example, you know, airline networks are small world, but they have a physical constraint as well, but you can very efficiently find, um, you know, if you want to get from any place to any place in the world, uh, you know, if you do a web search, it will very quickly tell you what <laughs> connectivity or what, what flights you should take. It's to, you know, if you look at, think about all the different places in the world, this should be a very computationally intractable problem. But, and actually because of the small world structure of uh, 
the airline network, you can find these things very, very efficiently. Um, you can also think about um, this sort of a thought experiment you could do, like if you say I wanted to send something, uh, you know, say I wanted to give Joe Biden something, like how would I do that? Um, you know, it's, you know, I don't know Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, when I thought through it, um, you know, it became very clear to me exactly who I should contact, uh, who is most likely to know someone who knows Joe Biden. Uh, in my case, that's Donna Twinsky, our CEO, because she seems to know everyone. Um, and so if I wanted to send something to Joe Biden, I would send, I would give it to Donna and then ask her to pass it on. So that's an example of, of this local algorithm. I can just see, okay, who's, who's, who tends to have the most connections? Who do I know? And I'm just gonna pass it to them. And, and that's gonna very likely lead to a, a, a very short number of hops to whoever I wanna get to. Yeah, you know, when I looked at, I, that was intuitively obvious when I looked at this airline picture because the airline picture, the way this works is we have these hubs, which are super highly connected to lots of places. And then, and, and then you, and then, and then you just have to get between the hubs and you're almost certain to get exactly it. yeah and that's and don is a hub but but that's exactly not, that's starting out with a different type of structure that's not like the ring structure you started with which was uh you know there's these these nodes are, are preferential right there's some nodes that are very different than other nodes um, yeah and so it's it, i'm not sure how surprising this result is given that you know <laughs> um <laughs> I think it's it's I, I I don't know surprising is the word but it's certainly a property that applies to small world networks of all types you know uh, you know that you can the fact that you can algorithmically just by knowing local information figure out a good way to get to anywhere else on on the graph is is pretty cool right? yeah I mean um, another another way to look at this is these hubs in the airline are fully connected graphs right they, they they're well, I'm not saying there's the star uh, they're connected in like a star way, right? I mean, you could yeah, say- Yeah, it's not shown. I mean, what's not shown here is that from each hub, you have tons of like local flights. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's so if you want I mean. to get to Ithaca, Ithaca, New York, you wouldn't, you know, you go somewhere. Well, in some sense, like some, or, that's some or ways that is shown here, right? It's shown here because all those lines run, running out from, from Chicago are they're not all to big destinations. So there's some small yeah, ones. Yeah. I, I'm just saying if I- and we were talking about algorithms for this earlier. If I start with the assumption that I have a certain set of nodes that are super connected, then only then then only have to find you know, a, then I could just find a few connections between those nodes. You're almost guaranteed to get your three-step um, result, which it doesn't seem surprising to me, I guess. Um, yeah. And, you, and yeah. you know, and you know what to do. If you live in Ithaca, you know you're going to have to fly to Chicago or to New York. You know, <laughs> to, get, to get someplace, you know. <laughs> right. So in, in the Donna case, maybe uh, a, a way that does make the idea a little interesting is that maybe Donna doesn't know any more people than any of us know. It's just she knows the right set of them, uh, the, the subset, the set of people she knows. The number of connections she has isn't different from our number of connections. It's, it's the particulars of what she's connected to, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, which is, yeah. it's not it's not purely a property of the graph, right? It, then it's, a, it's this other property of, that we were applying on top of that. Uh, no, no, that is a property of the graph because it, it, she's more likely to be connected to other clustered other clusters as opposed to. Well, well that's not uh, I think what Mark was saying. Mark was saying that she's just more connected to politicians, and and Mark is maybe more connected to science fiction fans or machine learning people or something. I don't know, you know, you know whatever it is. Yeah, um, yeah. So that you know, that may be a bias I'm applying because I know Donna is connected to politicians. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, that's yeah, but that's not a graph property. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So some of these things were, you know, the airlines, it's and and people like that, you were putting some sort of metadata on it. So we know. Um, okay, I mean, it just yeah. I mean, yeah. we started out with a very abstract representation of these you networks, know, and now now there's other layers of information that yeah, but I think uh, what John Kleinberg showed, you don't need that other layer, you can still find just by knowing that people are highly connected, you can still do a very good job. Um, how, how do you avoid just exploring, having to spider out from all of your four connections if you don't have any guidance? Well, if you, you, said, if you don't know anything about the cluster. Right, you just, you say you just connected then, to four people, you have no meta information whatsoever. What other algorithm do you have except to 
explore outwards uh, uh, to end hops to find you know the, the path. I'm not sure I, I get your question. Well, so, I, yeah. I think I, I think I do. I, it, I think it's related to my earlier comment. I was surprised that you said there's a local algorithm, but but you're really relying on the fact that you know that some of the people you're connected to are more connected than others. And that's not, I, I wouldn't include that in a local algorithm. I think what Kevin's saying, if all I know is I'm connected to four people, I know nothing about those four people, then uh, mm. there's, no, there's no directed way I can go about this. I just have to try. But if I know that one of those people is connected to a lot of other people, well, sure, that makes it easy. <laughs> go with them first, yeah. right? Um, but I would still call that local information. It's just, you know something about the people you're connected to, but you don't know, it's not transitive. You don't know yeah. anything about what they're, Connections are connected. Well, to. fine, but but then so it's still it, it's still local information. It's okay, but then it doesn't seem that surprising. Then, no, yes, yeah, so I, I know four people, and three of them, know, three of them know three other people, and one of them knows three hundred people. Well, I'm going to start person knows yeah. three other. <laughs> it seems to me that what you're really doing, or what we're kind of approximating, is you imagine you start with Joe Biden, and his distance from himself is zero, and you expand out one, and the distance is one, and so on. You basically, imagine you ran the whole A star algorithm to map the distance from Joe Biden to every person. And then what Subutai is doing is saying, okay, I know my distance to Joe Biden is somewhat large. And I know all the people that I know, I'm kind of like mentally estimating who might have the lowest distance and then sending the packet that direction, right? Which is kind of what Kevin, what Kevin was getting at. So if you had no information about this, it would seem like it might not work, might not work very well. But I don't I think wonder. You're, just, you're not just sending it to the people. I mean, you're saying to people, the, the general algorithm is sent to people who have the most connections, right? So that's the general algorithm. So I think when the path length is something like close to four, so, so Subutai is connected to some hub in his local region that he, and he has some knowledge about that hub. And then Biden is connected to lots of people. And there's a good chance that this hub knows that hub, then the whole thing can kind of work. But if you imagine that the path length is like 10, so, so Subutai knows a bunch of hubs whose distance is now nine to Biden. Biden knows a bunch of hubs whose distance is now eight to, to Subutai's hub. These two hubs might not know anything about the vast space between them. So like, would the local algorithms work in that case? Or is that way off to the left of Kleinberg's plots? No, I think Kleinberg, in Kleinberg's says that would, it, it would still be a relatively efficient algorithm to find short paths. I, I, mean, I didn't go through the details of all of these algorithms, but I think even in that case, you you can as long as you get your in the in the sweet spot of the clustering exponent, um, you can find efficient algorithms. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you you might not get the optimal shortest path, but you can get very good short paths. Mm -hmm. Well, you can in any of these situations, you may not get the optimal short path. I mean, you might say, oh, you know, I need to get from Ithaca to San Francisco, and I say, well, you know, or if I'm going to or Ithaca to you know. I don't know, some other little you know, Eureka, California, and you might say, well, I have to go to Chicago first, but maybe just by chance there's a connection to Ithaca to Eureka, California, and you know, you wouldn't have tested, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't have guessed that. Um, yeah. and then you wouldn't have gotten the right answer, right? But yeah. Okay, well, I didn't want to beat this up too much. Okay. Um, yeah, switching gears a little bit. Uh, so, you know, I talked about non-physical uh, networks and how it can, the, the key there the, the other really nice property is that we can find these algorithms. Um, so the other question is, does small world apply to learning at all? Um, and this is a paper that uh, Mitchell pointed us to, uh, you at all, which uh, I think really does a nice job of answering it. Um, it's 15 pages, not one or two and a half pages. Um, it's a very interesting paper, but a bit confusing in parts. I'm just gonna show a few highlights from it. And then we, uh, in a more detailed discussion, we can dive into it in more depth if, if people want. Okay. Um, so what they basically did is they had a, a, one of the things they did is they had an algorithm for taking graphs and converting them to neural network structures. Okay. And so what, what do I mean by that? So here's an example. So on the left is a fully connected multi-layer perceptron, just a bunch of linear layers going down. And what they said is this is basically equivalent to this graph on the right. Okay, so here's a fully connected graph with four nodes. Um, and what you 
the way to think about it is that these nodes are sending messages. So each uh, going from one layer to the next is sort of one round of a message exchange. Okay, so this is this graph. You can see how it might be equivalent to these two layers here. So node one is connected to all four nodes here in the next layer. Node two is connected to all four nodes and so on. Okay, so this you can think of this as a fully connected graph with four nodes with multiple rounds of message exchanges. Okay, so that's how they kind of formulated it. Um, and you can do a variety of different uh, network types here. So on the left here, you have again a four node graph, but you don't have the cross connections here. Um, and what that translates to is you have a, a unit one here, it connects to units one, two, and four in this case. Um, units two connects to one, two, and three, and so on. Okay, so this is a little bit like kind of the, uh, in visual cortex, we have receptive fields that are connected locally to a set of neurons below it. And that, that local connectivity is sort of shifted in a trans, you know, translationally. So that's an example of this. Um, you can also have disconnected stuff here. So you have these four nodes, they, there are no connections between this clique and this clique, and that corresponds to a graph like this. So they went through a bunch of different uh, variations and in some cases contortions to convert um, a bunch of, uh, to see how you can take graph structures, different types and, and think about the graph properties of ResNets and, uh, you know, multi-layer perceptrons with differing, you know, differing layer widths and so on. So we can go into that later if, if people want. Um, but basically they had a way of uh, thinking about a very large range of neural network structures as simpler kind of graph structures like this. So then uh, they also created a, a slight modification to the Watts-Strogatz algorithm to create neural network with a variety of path lengths and clustering coefficients. And this is an example of the range of networks that they're able to, uh, to create. So on the bottom, so this shows clustering coefficient and path length. And so on the bottom right, is a completely a fully connected graph. So this would be like the multi-layer perceptron I showed you, where every layer is fully connected. Um, on the on the left here, it would be a completely random graph. So this has very low clustering coefficient, um, uh, but reasonably low average path length. And then up here would be the equivalent of a ring lattice. Um, so here you would just have. Uh, you know, nodes just connected to its nearest neighbors, um, and that's it. And that would be, again, very similar to a typical model people have of visual cortex, where you have a set of, you have a neuron that's just connected to a small set of neurons below it, and that sort of continues on over there. And then you have a whole bunch of stuff in between. So small world networks would be kind of in between here. Okay. And then for what they can do is they can map points in here to different network structures and then run different uh, benchmarks on it. And you can look at the accuracy uh, of networks at different points in this uh, space. So, you know, here it's showing five layer multi-layer perceptron or ResNets. And then they ran a whole bunch of, diff oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they ran a whole bunch of different experiments. Uh, here's sort of one example experiment using CIFAR-10. Um, and what you can do is you can then look at the accuracy of these networks as a function of path length and, and clustering. Okay. And so what they found is in this case is that the best graph was right in the middle here. Uh, this is a, you know, the small world structure. And you can look at accuracy as a function of path length. So this is this vertical stripe here. And you can look at accuracy as a function of clustering coefficients. So this is this horizontal up here and you can get these u-shaped uh, curves. So, so there's like, this, yeah. I have a question about this. Um, it, were they applying the same connectivity graph to each layer in the network? So this is a multi-layer perceptron, are they, and they model the layer to layer interaction with that, as you showed earlier. And I, I believe so, I, I believe so, yeah. So they just uh, they take they take some graph structure and they repeat it over and over and over again. Uh, anyway. I, I believe so. Yeah, I think that's what they did. Um, that does. It, you could still have different layer widths, um, 
but oh. the underlying in their in their formalism the underlying graph structure i think was kept constant oh, well it can't be exactly the same that they're different layer widths but okay okay well that's one of the contortions they did is they allowed when you send messages you could you can have different dimensionalities of the messages mm, okay like so little, yeah little it's kind of it's a little contorted but yeah um, okay thanks um well, what's kind of interesting is this looked a lot like Kleinberg's <laughs> graphs to me, um, you know, you have this sweet spot of, of clustering coefficients. I thought that was kind of a cool uh, relationship. Um, the other thing that's important from our standpoint is what they did to do this is, you know, these graphs are sparser, right? And so at the bottom right, you have a fully connected, you know, fully dense network. Um, what they did is in order to create these sparse networks, they kept the number of operations, the flops count constant, as close to constant as possible. Okay, so this is a fully dense, fully connected network. So to get a sparse network here that has this similar flops count, they increase the layer widths. Okay, so they effectively increase the dimensionality of the network. So these, these are sparse networks that are embedded in a higher dimensional structure than, than these guys. So, that's, as you know, that I'm very interested in the relationship between dimensionality and sparsity. So I think that's, that sort of confirms some of the stuff that we saw. So consistently they would find uh, high accuracy. Uh, in the Higher network. accuracy than in the fully connected network. Than in the fully connected network. Uh, that's great. I mean, I mean this is the directly analogous to what we want to do, right? So, um, yeah. so it's not this sort of a confirmation of that. Exactly. Um, and so, I have a, they tried on a, a whole bunch of different network structures. Um, uh, they tried on an ImageNet and Cypher 10, uh, so a bunch of different benchmarks, and they consistently see that the best network is going to be somewhere in the middle here. When did this paper come out? Last when, year. Last year. So, are, I mean, are, are people like running to do these kind of networks now? Uh, good question. I don't know. I. I can point out one thing is that, and I point this out later, what, what, when we train static sparse networks, we're in this, we're actually not in this sweet spot. We create completely random static connectivity. So we're off to the left here. And so it seems obvious now that we should not be there. We should be creating. So can you explain, could you explain that again? I mean, we're, we're, what you say we're completely uh, when we create completely random. I mean, what would what would be not? We would we would try to cluster more. We purposely try to exactly more. exactly. We would try to cluster. Uh, we would sort of create more clustering in our randomness, if you will. Um, instead of when we have two layers, instead of completely randomly connecting them, um, we would try to include a little more clustering. And we could do that in a few different ways, but uh, that's one implication of of this. Can, can clustering comes from learning? In yeah, that's a great question. Um, they address that a little bit uh, in the paper. I don't have the graph here, but what they say is that if you start with a fully dense, densely connected network, and then it learns, they look at, look to see, does some sort of this clustering naturally emerge? And it looks like in their, in their findings, it kind of did, but not perfectly. Uh, so it seemed like there was some pressure or something to move towards this, but it wasn't great. And if they impose this as a prior, as a structure up front, and the, then they then uh, it works much better. So I'm I have a question. I, I don't remember the term we're using, but we did, when we when we were applying this into certain you know architectures, we weren't doing random clustering. We were doing these block blocks, these block structures, right? Um, I forget what we used the word for that was. Um, so those yeah, so weren't, I'll, I'll, that yeah. seems more like that. That seems like a local clustering, is it not? Exactly. Yeah. So that's actually one of my last discussion points. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so we've done so in the house of dense paper. I did completely random mass. Um, but let me get to that point. I think that's a super interesting point, actually. Um, but let me get to that in a bit. Okay. So can I ask uh, on this plot? Yeah. So the top one error. It seems like there's quite a lot of noise. Like there's quite a lot of variance for a given clustering coefficient in path length. Um, yeah. Is that just due to run by run 
you know, randomness, or are they actually missing a metric or two yeah. that actually really well predict performance? Um, very good question. Um, as I was putting this slide together this morning, I noticed something that was a little bit bizarre. Uh, I, well, this could be an artifact of the way they're doing it. I don't know how literal they are here, but you can see this yellow rectangle here, mm -hmm. and they're saying this yellow rectangle corresponds to this graph. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this yellow rectangle um, has a, you know, supposed to look at average path length, um, but actually it already has a bias towards, uh, what am I trying to say? There is a correlation between clustering <coughs> coefficient here and mm. path length mm. already right, right, in right. here. So if you were just to look at this bottom part here, where um, which would be path lengths between say 1.5 and 2.5, you know, that would be kind of in this part here. Now you don't see this curve anymore. <laughs> it's not as yeah. clear. It's a good point. It's so, a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. So, so there could be a single yeah, metric. So I'm not really sure that the answer to your question actually. So what you're saying is there could be a single metric underlying both of these curves that happens to produce a curve in two separate dimensions, but there's really only one metric that matters. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm wondering is, let's say we zoom in and just take a little tiny square region right in the middle of this plot. Right. So yeah. we remove some of these biases. Even in that square, you're going to have a, a large range of performance. Is, like, is that just this specific instantiation of the graph was lucky or unlucky? Yeah. If so, like, what is it about that instantiation that makes the graph lucky or unlucky? Like, could you could yeah. you like poke around that graph and find ah yes, there are two clusters that are barely connected or or something like that? Yeah, great great question. I don't I don't know. I think that would be really interesting to study because the, the variance is pretty high uh, here. Definitely, yeah. which means we're missing a lot of a lot of signal somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, totally agree. I think it's a very valid. Uh, point and uh, there's more investigation. I think uh, I guess that sort of calls into question: Is it really the small world structure? Uh, you know, could it be something else even? Um, yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, but, all, all this um, graph structure just de determines the architecture. But how do they train the network? So all that, how do they control it? I I think they did it by having a static mask over the weights. Um, and then they just use regular backprop uh, end to end. I think um, that's how they did the it. Hyperparameters uh, did you try a lot, or they just set them to be the same? Uh, good. I, I don't. I need to look at their code. Yeah, that's a great question because we found like in our work each instantiation yeah. would also have loss of variance. Variance exactly. But also here, yeah. each dot is like loss of instantiation. Also, there's just so yeah. many compounded complexities. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and the question about hyperparameters I think is very pertinent. We found that the hyperparameters at this end should be quite different than the hyperparameters here. So it might be that at each of these points, you really need to do an exhaustive hyperparameter study as well um, to really get the answer. And maybe that might explain some of what Jason was asking about as well. Um, Subutai, could you talk a little bit Bit about uh, on the last slide there, uh, the sparsity element. So you said that like this best graph had a certain sparsity. Um, yeah. Uh, that you know that corresponds to its. I, I guess yeah. But my question is basically, how should we think about these graphs in relation to sparsity? Can we look at you know uh, a curve like a curve here and say okay, sparsity is increasing as you go along this average path length and cluster of clustering coefficient, or like you know even in the measures versus performance graphs, uh, I would expect that. Along this vertical line, uh, along the vertical where there's a ton of variance, um, you know, could some of that be due to just varying amounts of sparsity? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good intuitive feel for that yet. Um, so clearly, anything that's not at this bottom right is sparse, okay. um, you know, uh, almost by definition. But exactly how, you know, percent sparsity lays on top of this, I don't have a good intuition for yet. Um, okay. Yeah. So I wish they had plotted that. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. someone else uh, can think of this. I can't think of this on the fly, but um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, the you know, and probably these guys up here are likely to be very sparse. 
uh, because they're just connected to their uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. But unclear here. Okay. What, what, what's the magnitude of these layer sizes? They, they squeeze up and down in order to keep the flops constant, but how, uh, how, uh, how large do the dimensions uh, of these things range? Yeah, I do, again, good question. I don't remember seeing that in the paper. Um, maybe, maybe it's in the supplemental stuff okay. or maybe they, they have, I did download their code base and briefly looked through it. So it might be in there. Um, okay. But that would be another, it'd be really good to know the answer to that, I think. I mean, All that I would answer the sparsity that, question too, once yeah, we know that. Yeah, exactly. So um, I could probably just run their code and just plot those two things out. I don't have to run the training to get those two bits of information. Um, so, okay, so they saw this in a bunch of benchmarks and network structures, which is nice. So this, this seems to suggest their somewhat arbitrary construction might actually be a, a it's a, at least a reasonable construction. Um, they also correlated the numbers they found to cortical networks. Um, and they found that the best, the sweet spot was very close to the, uh, the measured numbers from the cortex. Um, so here on the, in this top table here, they're looking at the path length and the clustering coefficients. This, this of, is the, these are the, these are the um, regions of region connectivity, the stuff that, um, yeah. That, but that, I, didn't I, include, that didn't include the thalamic connectivity. And no. that's, a, that's a really weird thing to be measuring. They're, yeah, they're measuring yeah. different types of, there are multiple graphs in that graph. You know what I'm saying? There are multiple right. types of connections <laughs> in that graph. And so it's not really yeah. one graph. Okay, exactly. So, so, so I, you have to take all this. Uh, yeah. So we have salt. to take it with a grain of salt. So this is using the Feldman and Van Essen style of connectivity, which has a lot of flaws, um, but it is what it is. And, and you get these coefficients. I will say that in this paper, which I, I skimmed through, they look at a, many different types of connectivity in the brain. They also look at like fMRI range stuff where they're looking at causal connections between different brain regions and stuff. But, um, you know, all of that stuff as we know, has to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but still, it's kind of interesting that their best numbers are very you know, close to the numbers uh, that are reported uh, you know, using the Feldman and Van Essen type uh, yeah, styles. Yeah, I, I, it is interesting. But you know, even think about something like this. You know, in cortical networks, you know, it's, it's not just how many hops to get someplace. You have to have, let's say, 20 synapses to a pattern of other sparse patterns someplace and, and, and you know you can't say oh i got all my connections because three of my half three times and two of my half yes times. yeah there's, there's so many other things going on here that i don't know you could only yeah i mean very, but that, that, generalizations here yeah that's true uh you know that that particular thing that you need to have a sufficient number of connections to recognize patterns i think is true for neural network architectures too um, so you can't, you couldn't just have one connection and transmit all the information. You still need, you know, clusters of connections. I don't have any questions about that. It's it's when you start talking about the cortex is like, well, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a, I mean, I mean the other way I look at it, the other way I look at it is, you know, you can, there are pathways. You can, you could talk about different types of pathways in the neocortex. And my guess is many of those pathways will have small world structure. I think I, I, I've sort of convinced myself that this really is a pretty fundamental property. Um, and yes, this type of, this is not the only type of pathway there is in the neocortex and many other pathways, but um, I would be actually very surprised if those other pathways also didn't have a small world. Sure, structure. I can buy that. I, I can buy that, but I just think that this particular data is a bit, a bit yeah. yeah. Um, and this is the connectivity between regions, again, using the Feldman and Van Essen, they're just plotting the connectivity and this is the connectivity of their best multi-layer perceptrons. Um, so again, the, the numbers are very consistent with these two measures. Wait, okay, so that, just, sorry, yeah. on that last slide, is the CIFAR 10 error for cat cortex? How, how is that <laughs> going on there? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, <laughs> What does that mean? Is that the experiment I hope it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't I heard about it. <laughs> no. no. That would be great. But great error bars. 
Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, if they ran a multi-layer perceptron on Cypher 10 using, well, I should, using I should go back and read the paper. Using the path, I, using the path length. Numbers. Yeah, but now I don't know, understand why this is the highest one. So that can't be. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I need to look back at the paper. We could do that maybe after the, uh, I can pull up the paper. We could try to find out. <laughs> I don't think this is actually doing experiments where they're, showing cats sci-fi 10 images. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, those kinds of things do happen where they'll show animals uh, images and then they'll try to classify what the image is based on the neural firing. Like that's certainly yeah. happened for macaque. So, uh, so it's probably happened for cat as well. Yeah, I yeah. I think but, cat's but... gonna get 30% sci-fi 10. <laughs> that's a pretty smart cat. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I don't know. Cypher 10 images are kind of small. Uh, 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 that is, uh, okay, just a couple of slides more on discussion and then we can um, kind of start wrapping up or go into more details. But um, as I mentioned before, for static sparsity, uh, for our networks with static sparsity, we've mostly used completely random sparsity. So uh, it could be the case that small world sparsity could be a lot better. It's something I really want to try out now uh, with our stuff. Um, We've done dynamic sparse algorithms. Um, so uh, I forget who it was that asked the question there, Jeremy. Um, you know, do they end up learning small world structures? So like the stuff that Marcus uh, has worked on, you know, do they eventually end up learning small world structures? Or if they don't, uh, you know, should they be implemented to prefer small world structure when they're doing the uh, rewiring? Um, you know, could that help? Um, this is the point, Jeff, you brought up. This, to me, really explains why block sparse works weights work. So when we did hardware implementations, we've had very constrained block sparse weights where you literally had to have like fixed numbers of blocks in each row and columns and, and regions and so on. When we first started doing that, we were very concerned because this is really constraining the set of weights, whereas it felt like totally random sparsity should work well because there's fewer constraints. You can really connect all sorts of stuff up, but the block sparse weights might actually be small world, might actually have a small world structure because they're locally clustered plus you have these other uh, connections. But more generally, uh, small world sparsity could be very good for hardware implementations because you're really limiting, communication is a big issue with hardware implementations. And with small world structures, it seems like you could kind of optimize the communication um, efficiency or fidelity in there. So if you can map your problem to small world structures, and if you have hardware implement structures that can that can efficiently run those, that might actually be a really nice sweet spot for cortical so, structures so or other structures. This, this might this might also come up with a relationship as to what should the block size be relative to the entire. Uh, Matrix yeah. size. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. In our in our block sparse implementations, were the blocks fully connected? Each block was uh well, uh, yeah, you would have a block of weights connecting to another block of uh, so, weights and yeah, then be fully okay. connected. Okay, yeah. so so what it strikes me then is like, okay, we did that for a hardware constraint. You just pointed out that that's a, a it's a useful thing. So then you could try to imagine a whole series of studies that were done under that that extra constraint, which is that the you know the clusters are fully connected, and uh, that's going to be required because that's going to take most efficient use of your hardware, right? Um, yeah. And which is which is a subset of the general uh, small world networks that have these clustering, and you know th th that could be like a general principle that applies to all future hardware uh, implementations of AI, um, which is really interesting to know. Yeah. You know, if you yeah. explore that particular subspace here. Where the, where the clusters are fully connected. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, is, is that in principle, they're fully connected, but we've, at least I've never examined to see if any of them have been driven to zero after training. So there could be some variability in there. Yeah. Yeah, but that would be okay. That, that would be fine, I think. Um, well, you know, I mean, we, well in, in our networks, we have say a set of weights would be projecting to some cluster of neurons at the next layer, and then another cluster of neurons also in the same layer. So we, there would be multiple blocks um, that are typically connected. And that might be sufficient to have 
the small world properties. I don't know. Because uh, it's not enough to have just have clustering. You also have a few, you need a few of these random connections and a few of these longer range connections. Yeah. Um, and so that might be sufficient, which would which, which is uh, really interesting. I mean, it really sort of it, it suggests there might be a sort of a, a very theoretical and, and practical um, way of doing sparsity on all kinds of hardware in the future. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so we, we we came about it very cleverly from another direction. You know, well, the same direction, but we didn't come at it from this theoretical point of view. Um, we came at it from a practical point of view, but we stumbled onto something that that was could could be proven theoretically. Too could be really, yeah. I, I, I yeah. remember we were, you know, when we were doing this last year, all of us were just shocked that with block sparse weights, we we didn't lose anything in accuracy. <laughs> it, it was really, I remember, it was very surprising to all of us. Um, so, but so, this could be an explanation uh, for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, skip connections in ResNet act as those long connection, long range connections yeah, you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you know, skip connections also in the neocortex can act as some of these random connections. Um, you can also, but, but they tend to be a little more structured as well. So you, know, you can also think of them, they're also clustered, but some of the long range lateral connections we have in the brain or um, they're just a bunch of connections that are just not explained by theory in neuroscience. And they may be just there just to satisfy the small world property. Yeah. Um, so uh, one, so thing you, one thing you might- yeah, go ahead. You might try. Um, so in this paper, they generate a graph structure and then they kind of copy paste it for every layer. Like every layer has the same graph structure, but uh, I guess different learned weights, right? Um, but you don't yes. need to use the same graph structure every layer. So you could imagine rather than copy pasting that graph structure every layer, kind of like generating a new graph structure in subsequent layers. But then you'd like mm -hmm. for it to still hold the properties that are you know desirable, like this short path length and cluster. Clustering. Yeah, so, you should probably still get all the properties. Yeah. So well, so and then you mentioned trying block sparse, which is nice because block sparse uh, it's kind of more efficient on GPUs, right? As long as you're loading in a bunch of weights and a bunch of activations, you kind of want to like make full use of them before writing them back to memory. Yep. So I wonder whether you could do the following. So the layer, so the, the layer to layer connectivity, so the weight matrix could be just fully block sparse. Um, but then at, at the next representation layer, rather than applying the same block sparse structure, which would probably result in like a bunch of neighborhoods that are very well connected within themselves, but not communicating with other neighborhoods, you could just apply like on that layer, uh, some shuffling operator. So, so block sparse to get a representation, then you kind of like reshuffle the neurons and then use another block sparse weight matrix after that. I see, okay. If you tune yeah. the shuffling operation, for example, if you had a shuffle that mostly didn't move anything, but occasionally randomly switched two nodes, I bet layer to layer, you would get both fast computation, efficient computation, and the small world kind of effective connectivity. That could be kind yeah, of a yeah. sweet spot where it's right. Yeah, that'd be a, that's a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, exactly. If you, if you, and particularly if your permutation or shuffling, you know, mostly left things intact, but randomly shuffled a few things, you'd get these effectively, these random long range connections, but you could still maintain the block sparse uh, nature for hardware. Uh, and you could probably do shuffling efficiently on a GPU with the right, some, yeah. some little bits of cleverness. Like it's, it's just a element wise operation. At that point. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think this whole, this is like another, maybe you could see what I meant by rabbit holes. Like every aspect of it, there's like a whole, like a whole bunch of things we could uh, dive into. Uh, and this could have very, very, you know, important practical applications on here. Okay. Um, okay. I just want to point out that dimensionality seems to matter again. Um, I don't know if Jeff is still here, um, stepped out, but um, I think this applies to cortical columns. Um, we often show our cortical columns as this sort of 2D sheet here um, for, for you guys, uh, you know, cortical columns, are what we think are the sort of canonical computational blocks in the neocortex. And they're kind of laid out in this 2D sheet. Uh, if you could think of the neocortex is basically a 2D sheet that's scrunched up and stuffed into our skulls. But you get all these cortical columns that are laid out in this uh, way. We often uh, draw them as being 
connected laterally like this, because uh, in our theory, there's a voting operation that goes on laterally between uh, cortical columns. So we often draw them this way. And we've actually, in our implementations, we implement them this way. Well, what does that mean? That means we basically implemented ring lattices <laughs> in our implementations. Um, and we've actually looked at convergence when you don't have full global connectivity, when you just have local connectivity, but we never had random long range connections in there. We just basically had ring lattices. So maybe we should put in random long range connections that might significantly help the connect the convergence. And conversely, I wonder in the brain there, there might be random long range connections even within a level like V1 or the thing. So um, looks like Jeff disappeared because I would expect him to comment at this point, but. <laughs> um, and then more generally, you know, brain-wide, uh, it might be that the number of long-range connections, a small number should be sufficient. Uh, in, we, we do see a lot of long-range connections throughout the neocortex that's not explained by theory. I think the small world stuff sort of says that that does not have to be uh, a very large number in order to get very efficient sort of communications and uh, you know, across the different regions. Okay, I'll... the other, okay, these are less well-formed. So first of all, small world networks seem to be great at synchronizing oscillations across brain areas. So we've talked a little bit in our theories about synchronizing oscillations, but small world structures are good at that. So that's nice. Um, Jeff briefly mentioned SDRs and population codes. Um, I think those things and active dendrites naturally lead to locally clustered graphs. Um, so again, this, this clustering property, uh, I think, would naturally show up anyway. Um, in general, it may make really large-scale learning easier um, to have these uh, structures. Okay, so that's all I had you know, actively prepared. Um, Anything else um, you guys want to talk about? We can go, uh, if you want, we can go to the paper. I know it's been a, it's been a, uh, we've been over an hour now, so you can also stop anytime. So you mentioned to me or in our email thread earlier, your idea about whether efficient local shortest path length algorithms would be related to like ease of training. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. say that in a, in a few more sentences, maybe? Yeah. So, what? Uh, so, if small world structures really lead to better accuracy, um, what I was wondering is what does that say about the loss landscape? Um, we know that dense networks. If you look at dense networks compared to completely random static sparse networks the random sparse networks have the loss landscape looks really bad. Um, it's like extremely lumpy and, and not smooth at all. I think I saw a paper about that somewhere. Um, dense, densely connected networks presumably have a very smooth loss landscape. Maybe small world structure gives you enough of a smooth lens, loss landscape to make allow learning to happen reasonably efficiently in the same way that just a little bit of random, uh, a little bit of clustering, or, or you know, the, in the same sense that clustering allows you to efficiently, clustering and long range connections allows you to run, uh, efficiently propagate information. Could it be that the lost landscape also looks reasonably, uh, sufficiently nice to allow learning to happen? And that, that was just a conjecture. I think it'd be interesting to look at that. Um, I don't know what measures there are of, you know, we could measure the smoothness of lost landscapes or if there's some other better measure um, that can characterize this. Uh, maybe speed of learning uh, could be one. Um, you know, uh, we found in, in with random static, uh, random static sparse networks that momentum really hurts in, in accuracy, which was, kind of makes sense if the lost landscape is really bad, but momentum is a really nice thing to have and <laughs> it speeds up learning. So maybe if we have small world structures, we could put momentum back in, maybe it'll work better if it looks reasonably well. Anyway, these are sort of some of the thoughts 
that are going in, I wonder if it would be interesting to, you know, actually actively investigate that. So. Well, that, that to me implies that um, maybe uh, you could integrate momentum in depending upon say the local smoothness of the structure right. around it. So uh, to the, if it's, if it's if it's oscillating up and down, that to me implies a couple of things. A, it doesn't matter which way the values are, uh, but if basically you get some very strong stable region, uh, want to kind of converge, you know, quickly to the point where okay, this is locked on down, and if these other guys are oscillating up and down, I, I don't really want to uh, to magnify. I want to critically damp whatever that is or ignore it altogether. So it's, I think when you're solving a set of, I don't know, stiff differential equations or something like that, what, what the analogy is, is, is that you, uh, if it's not uniformly stiff, if it's variable, you need to have an adaptive technique that looks to see the nature of things. Once you've explored the landscape, characterize the landscape and then converge quickly onto where you can put your most effort. So I, and I'm sure People have written loads of papers on this. I just, you know, it's not within my reading list, but uh, I think this is what it's implying. That's a cool perspective, Kevin. Did you happen to see our um, loss change allocation paper a couple of years ago? No. <laughs> not, not many people saw it. Um, we, we found some, we found a really interesting behavior where if you're training all the layers at the same time with the same learning rate and momentum, um, it seemed, and we measured it later, that some layers kind of like learn faster than others. And then it, it's like they adapt faster and other layers adapt more slowly. And if you slowed down the slow layers too much then the whole system kind of became unstable and like did create one of these oscillatory modes. But if you hmm. uh, sped up the slower layers so that they were then commensurate with the faster layers, then the whole network behaved better. And the way we did this is literally just by tuning momentum. So adding momentum in a, in a sort of a control system sense is just like introducing a time delay. So momentum of 0.9 is like a time delay of 10 steps. So, so the, uh, the gradient steps being made have to do with the lost landscape on average 10 steps ago if you're using exponential. Delay. Anyway, we messed around with just tweaking separate momentum terms for each layer. And we found that we could essentially like speed up the right layers and get the whole thing synchronized pretty well. You might like paper. I please send me a link. Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah, we'll do it. Uh, yeah I'm. I'm just thinking that uh, that's in in one dimension, which is between the layers. But I think what this is arguing is that that could occur anywhere. I mean, if you consider these things um, cluster, you know, in these dimensions, then this is it's with the randomization. You're kind of exploring the space simultaneously and you would like to be able to learn where it's most productive to 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 go and i don't know where you make that decision point but once you start seeing the shape of the landscape then a lot of techniques that use are used in you know momentum is one of them or, or newton's method really you know uh that are used in these large systems of equations and not just two-dimensionally could be applicable you know, to this thing to really speed things on up locally. It's it's harder to visualize how you do that efficiently on a GPU because GPU li likes to look at stuff really uniformly and just ram things through, you know, uh, as much as possible. But uh, it might be worth it if you if you you could break it up into blocks or or or, or, or uh, uh, quantize it in some kind of spatial sense. Maybe that would be a way of approaching you know something like that to, to take advantage of the fact that this corner of the tensor is going to be stable and this one's not you know so adapt appropriately uh, I, I look at the fact that when we when we put the block structures on in um, and we pick a kind of random structure for the blocks the rest of the network has to kind of adapt to route the information through those blocks so there's that aspect of it as well if you make it too sparse then there's not enough channels to, you, you have like a, a, a really bad autoencoder. You know, you just don't have enough capacity to get things through. If you, if you make it uh, too dense, 
then it has all these alternatives, which means you know things can back and flow and oscillate because there's more than one way of doing this thing. There's no clear winner sometimes. So I think the sweet spot is partially due to the fact that you give enough variability that you can find a solution, but not so many that you spend infinity looking for what the optimal one is. So it, 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 you know, on many levels, this small networks kind of uh, uh, small world networks make sense to me because the the extremes obviously have problems, and there's obviously going to be a sweet spot in any one particular thing. Uh, and I, I think your point of of, of uh, saying that we don't necessarily use the same structure on each of the levels is is true. From the hardware point of view, if you're working on a level, you would like the in and out graphs to be identical across the thing so you can use the same allocated hardware resources, the same DSPs, whatever, to kind of churn through the thing. And if it's variable, you basically have to find the worst case and then you throw away computrons on, on that. So there's reasons I, I, for- I, I'm sorry, I have to leave. Apologize, sir. Thank you, everyone. I'll I have to do something before our next meeting. I'll see you, bye. Yeah, okay. We should probably wrap up in Fiverr in a few minutes because we have all have a noon meeting as well. Uh, but. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I'm, cool. I'm done. Well, does anyone uh, know of good ways to good efficient ways to measure the loss landscape in some ways, or to characterize it? Um, I'm not too familiar with that. That whole area. I mean, we could do brute force, but that's not very good. <laughs> um, there there are techniques for visualization, but um. I don't know how much you want to read, read into them. There's a paper by Lee et al. from 2017 that visualizes the lost landscape for things like dense nets and resnets. And they, you can kind of see that, okay, these are pretty smooth compared to when you do it with other networks. But uh, mm -hmm. in terms of there's, uh, you know, it's, it's a super high dimensional space. So, so I don't know how, yeah. <laughs> how, how much you can trust them, any visualization of it. Um, you can also compute things like sharpness of the solution, but I don't know if this gets at um, like how smooth it is throughout training. But yeah, the, yeah. the Lee et al. paper uh, from 2017 is, is, I think, a good good one. Okay, I'll, I'll look that up. Thank you. Is that L-E-E -E or L-I? Um, it's uh, L-I. And, oh, actually, there, I think okay. there's two L-I et al. papers that are on the lost landscape, which are great. The other one was with, with, which, uh, with Jason and Roseanne, although I believe it's, it's a different person. You mean the intrinsic dimension table? Yeah, yeah. Do you mean that? Yeah. I see. Uh, just okay. one thought. If you guys do want to pursue this direction, in particular, if you do want to switch from your random sparsity to some type of structured sparsity and then try training networks and see if they happen to work better, um, Jeff mentioned or alluded earlier that uh, there's this awkward awkward choice of a one-dimensional domain to start with, this ring this ring graph, or you could just as awkwardly choose a two-dimensional domain to start with. But in any case, you might not want to have to make that sort of choice. So there are small world, there are methods of generating small world networks that don't require you to choose this type of uh, manifold up front. So I think Mitchell could probably talk more about this. There's like a Barbasi, Albert, something or other. Uh, intuitively, you can just, you can start randomly connecting things. And then when, when it's time to make a new connection, you can uh, evaluate all possible connections and you could say directly sample, do I want to connect to one of my neighbor's neighbors or not? And just assign a probability for that, which doesn't imply any dimension in manifold. Mitchell, anything else to add there? Um, no, although, um, yeah, it would be really interesting to think about, um, I think that this was something that came up in our, in our meetings one time was, like a uh, certain dimension out, like uh, depending on the dimensionality of the space, if you just imagine, um, you know, a grid and then you connect nearest neighbors there um, and then three dimensions, like uh, as you sort of increase the dimensionality there, you are actually increasing your, your um, clustering coefficient and because it's almost like increasing K uh, in the, yeah. in, on, on the algorithm that you're presenting. So it's like, in, it would be interesting uh, I mean, okay, I don't know what I'm, I'm talking about here, but it would be interesting to see what sort of sparsity patterns are induced, for example, in 2D versus 1D and in 3D versus 2D. And, and you know, maybe, um, I don't know, like what, whatever, um, 
if there's any sort of thing that you know that the brain looks like to see, okay, for this sort of, um, you know, topology, what's actually this, this sort of nearest neighbor graph that's induced. Um, mm -hmm. So just applying this, uh, you know, random switching algorithm to just other things that aren't the ring. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good, good idea. Yeah, I think in the paper, they also walked through, a, uh, they, they compared their generator with a few other ways of generating small world networks, um, which was nice. Okay, anything else? Other questions? Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it helped satisfy <laughs> my need to talk about this because I was just stuck in this rabbit hole. So hopefully it was helpful to some, some of you and hopefully interesting. Um, I'm gonna keep looking into this a little bit and see if we can apply it to our stuff, but thank you so much everyone for, for participating. Thank you.